Welcome to Wednesdays in the Word, and welcome back to part two of a private conversation, Prophetic Patterns. And we're looking at the 24th chapter of Matthew. We'll be reading out of there. So if you'll go to Matthew chapter 24, you'll probably want to get your uh, pencils ready, your notepads ready. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of information that you're going to want to just dissect, look into, do further research. And I, I would, I would uh, definitely encourage you to do so. Um, and so I will meet you at Matthew 24 here in just a bit. But I want us to get started right away with the word of prayer uh, for today's teaching. Father in heaven, we praise you. We love you. We adore you. You are an awesome and wonderful God. Father, we come to you as mere mortals. Uh, your scripture calls us earthen vessels. Lord, we understand our humble place in all of your creation, Lord God. And we also understand that because of the work of your Son and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how high you set us up, Lord God. Father, we have audience with you. What a privilege, Lord God, that is to have that audience. And, and we praise you for it and we thank you for it, Lord God. And, and, and we humbly accept that, Lord. And this morning, Lord, I ask that your word would be blessed to those who hear, Lord God, those who study it even more. And Lord Father, that you would enlighten our hearts and our minds to our day and our time in a prophetic type message, Lord God, so that we can prepare our hearts our minds, our lives, so that we are fit for the kingdom, Lord God, for when you soon return for us. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are going to return for us, and you are not going to leave us in all of this chaos. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for all of that. I ask that you bless the hearer, Lord God, bless the word to the hearer. Lord God, I ask that you you bless me that you, Lord God, guide my words today so that they would be a blessing to those who you have ordained, Lord God, to hear this message and so that you would be pleased, Lord God, so that you would be worshipped and glorified and pleased in all that we say and do in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Jumping right into Matthew chapter 24, <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to start at verse one. We'll read down a few verses, uh, the first seven verses, and, and that that uh, kind of uh, uh, brought a thought back to my mind. I don't know if uh, if it would it probably would distract from the teaching if I had a bell or some sort of a notification sound every time I use the number seven or the number one, or number three, or number four. Because in this prophecy today, uh, in what we're going to look at, you're going to see those numbers coming up, or multiples of those numbers coming up over and over and over. And uh, to, to begin with, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. We're looking at verse 1 through 7 to begin with. <clears throat> and this is a private conversation that Jesus holds. If you go into the archives, you'll be able to look at part one. That's the archives at First Baptist Church Aztec. And you can go to those at www.firstaztec.org. And uh, look at the, the first part of this teaching. I don't want to go into too much, but this is a private conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples on the Mount of Olive, which is real important. And we'll get to, to the, its importance in a while as well. And it reads, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Now, that's a great question. And I'm sure that Jesus was going beyond just the building and just the stones. Because in the world of prophecy, we have to understand that there are multiple layers. There's prophecy that is based on history. There's prophecy that is prophetic 
a, a prophetic word for that day, but it can also have a prophetic message for the days to come as well. And we also see that there could be a recurring pattern to these prophecies. So Jesus asks questions. Do you not see all of these things? And he goes on and says, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, and it's interesting, the Mount of, Mount of Olives, and I'll get to something in a little while. You're going to go, wow, this is where he's giving this message from. Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear, and here's what I really want to key in on today, verse 6 and 7, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. It kind of sounds like the, 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 either the newspapers or just all the, the, the news that you're getting out of television, even just this week, for the past week. See that you are not troubled. That's his directive to us. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places nation against nation if you look within our own nation there's nations that are rising up against nations now i don't want to go too too far with that thought and and i'm going to preface with this because i don't want to go too far with that thought about making connections to the United States right now and acting or trying to put off or uh, even suggesting that the United States is in the scriptures here. Because as far as written wise, as far as uh, what we pull from there, no, the United States is not in the scriptures. Therefore, it is not in the prophecy. You cannot find the United States here in prophecy. But I will say this. This country was based on a Judeo-Christian principle and Judeo-Christian ethics. And, and because of that, and, and I'm not going to go into the history. You can dig up the history. There is so much there to prove that. Uh, the, the, from the time that the pilgrims came and sought God, uh, uh, freedom to be able to seek God and, 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 and uh, so many leaders who have fallen on their face before God. With that said, this nation has been a blessed nation because so many people have surrendered their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that, this nation has been blessed under that banner of the church. But I need to say this, and here's where, although the United States is not written into prophecy, the United States does fall under that as well. And here's how it works. Because we, the Christian church, are grafted into the nation of Israel via Jesus Christ himself, then all the principles all the precepts, all that God uh, being holy and his, allow, his law allows for, we also fall under those through Jesus Christ. I'm not dispensing with the idea of grace, but what I am saying is this. If Israel was held to a standard, so too the United States will be held to that exact standard. And if Israel was punished because of their idolatry, because of the shedding of innocent blood, so too the United States will be held accountable for their idolatry and for their shedding of innocent blood. And these things come in various forms. And Jesus spells them out here. Plagues, in verse 7, wars, Plagues, pestilences, uh, famines, and earthquakes. And that's where I'm going to start today. And I want us to jump over real quick to uh, Amos 
chapter 1, verse 1. And in Amos chapter 1, and I'm going to go through quite a bit of scripture, and I'm going to go as quick as I possibly can. There's a couple of uh, slides that I would like to show you here in just a little bit to explain a few things. But last week I had mentioned that I'm going to put together the idea of signs and wonders, nature, including the stars in the skies and what takes place on earth, as signs, signs. Uh, if you're driving down a highway and there's a sign that says there, construction in half a mile, you know to prepare yourself for that construction. And so these are signs. I don't want you to walk away from here today thinking, here are these times and here are these dates, this is happening. What I'm saying is here are visible signs that we can look at that tell us to prepare for what is to come and for what is to come shortly. And I'll underline it by this. The scripture, Jesus himself said, no man will know the hour, no man will know the day. But he uses the parable of the fig tree. We covered that last week. The parable of the fig tree to point out we can know the season. And I'm telling you, more than ever, we are in that season. And many, many scholars, biblical scholars and pastors who study this are telling the same exact thing. We are in that season. And if you don't believe us, turn on your news and you will see the tremendous tumult and chaos even within our nation. And that shows you some of those signs. But moving on from there, I want to look at the earthquakes for a little bit uh, uh, for one of those signs, and then we're going to go to the heavens. And Amos 1.1 reads like this. The words of Amos, who is a prophet, uh, who was among the sheep herders, and, and he's one of those prophets that's not a learned prophet. He's not a practicing prophet. He's not one who was taught the idea of prophecy. He was a shepherd and, and, and a fig planter. And, and because of that, uh, God chose him to give him the prophetic word. So it says, The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders of, the, of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, keep that in mind, Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the, the earthquake. Hmm. Now the Bible doesn't mention things just to mention things. Amos is talking here two years. He's, he's talking about something that's going to take place, but he's, he's talking about two years before the earthquake. Well, what earthquake are we talking about? And I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but let's go on with Amos a little bit more. We're going to look at Amos chapter 3 real quick, uh, verse 14. Amos chapter 3, verse 14. <clears throat> that in... Uh, that in the day I punish Israel for their transgressions, I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. The earthquake, which I'm going to talk about, reached even to this altar and shook that temple and destroyed that temple in Bethel. Moving on, six. Uh, still in, in Amos, chapter 6, verse 11. For behold, the Lord gives a command. He will break the house, speaking of that particular house, into bits. That's what the word temple means, a house. Into bits and the little house into pieces. The little house. See, because the big house, the big temple was in Jerusalem. This one was in Bethel, to the north of Jerusalem. Okay, moving on from there, verse 8, chap, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 8 of Amos, verse 8 of Amos, 8-8. Eight, eight. Shall the land not tremble for this, and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. A lot of people have recorded earthquakes saying that the ground swells. Uh, and the last one in Amos will be chapter 9, verse 1, starting there. I saw the Lord standing by the altar. He said, God said this to, to Amos, Strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake 
and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Okay, and it goes on to talk with the rest of that chapter. If you want to want to read through the rest of that chapter, uh, it, it, it's incredible w- with what he's talking about here. And he, he also is talking about uh, an earthquake that will come in, in, in a time like no others uh, that, that, that it will take place. Now, Amos 1.1 has a direct um, reference in the book of Zechariah. And we'll go to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. And here's where the Mount of Olives comes in, uh, another little part of it. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5. Uh, If you back up to verse 4, here's where it talks about, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two, Zechariah is prophesying, an earthquake to come. So here's an earthquake that I'm, I'm going to be talking to you about that was in history, that was prophesied, was in history, recorded in the scriptures, and recorded in history. But now Zechariah is talking about another earthquake that will come, which also there's a reference in Revelation to that great earthquake that will take place. And, and Zechariah points out specifics about this earthquake right here. Uh, Verse 4 says, And the Mount of Olives, this is where Jesus is giving this private conversation from, the Mount of Olives will be split into two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half to the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain uh, valley shall reach Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. There's another mention, third mention to that specific earthquake. So he gives reference. The way you ran then, that's how it's, you're going to run in the future. Before I leave this, uh, let, let me camp here just for a little bit. This particular earthquake is supposed to also usher the Messiah into Jerusalem again. And he's going to go in through the eastern gate. Mount of Olives is exactly to the east of Jerusalem. So if the Mount of Olives is split east to west and there's a passage, it goes directly to that particular eastern gate. Now that eastern gate was sealed shut years after Christ came in A.D. 1540 by Suleiman the Magnificent, who was a Muslim, and this was during the Ottoman Empire. And he knew the prophecies, and he said, I'm going to seal this. And he cemented that door shut to prevent the Jewish Messiah from coming. But this earthquake says it's going to rattle the Mount of Olives, which is to the east of that gate, and that will split it open, and that eastern gate will open. That eastern gate is important because it is the absolute closest entrance to the temple and the Holy of Holies. And the Messiah, who we know as Jesus Christ, when he comes the second time, will walk right through those gates to the area of the temple to reclaim the city that is his. Okay, moving on. Um, Now, uh, I want to point out that uh, in Isaiah 6, 4, uh, the, the, the other reference to this exact earthquake that, we, that we've been referencing here, Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 4, uh, the, Isaiah 6, 1 is real, real uh, uh, well known. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Okay, so it gives reference there. But 6, 4, and this is Isaiah when he gets the call to become the prophet and what took place then. In Jerusalem, remember the temple in Bethel was shaken to bits, but in Jerusalem to the south, further south, which uh, let me pause right here because this is, this is really interesting. There is a fault line that runs north to south through, uh, 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 along the, the Dead Sea 
uh, area and this this Dead Sea uh, fault line, uh, uh, the they call it the Dead Sea Transform Fault Zone. It runs north to south. This prophet says that this earthquake is going to go east to west. If you have north to south and you have east to west right across Jerusalem, well, you just made a cross. Well, uh, that's not as important. But this east to west, when the fault goes north to south can only be done through Jesus Christ uh, uh, upon his return. So in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 4, it says, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So God's voice cries out. Now, I want to point this out, that Hosea, Amos, where we started with Amos, and Jonah are all contemporary prophets. Jesus refers to Jonah and he says, uh, when, when, when the, the, the uh, uh, illegal religious minds were coming to him and saying, hey, give us a sign, give us a sign of who you are. He says, this wicked generation, uh, they call for a sign. The only sign I'm going to give to them is the sign of Jonah. All right, let's take a look at that. And I believe that is Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to try to get there as quick as I can. All right, Matthew chapter 16, and da, 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 da. yeah, I'm going to drop, uh, go up to verse 4. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. He didn't say any more than that. Now, some people want to refer to that as a three days in the belly of Jonah where he died. And some scholars, and I agree with those scholars, that Jonah actually died. Some say that he was just asleep for those three days. And then he was resurrected after that and went into Nineveh. And this is where we're going with the idea of the earthquake. So stay with me. But there's a, there, there, Jesus says, this is the sign that I'm going to give you. Not just the three days, but I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. Well, what was going on with Jonah? So Jonah is a rebellious prophet, doesn't want to go to Nineveh. Then he uh, gets uh, tossed overboard in a very uh, bad tempest, which uh, Nineveh is way far away from the ocean. So Jonah is way far away as well. And he went, he went totally the opposite way of Nineveh. And as he's in there, the, the men throw him overboard uh, and, and the, the tempest calms and they cry to God, the men that were there on the boat. Jonah goes down and says, a great fish swallows him up. Three days he was in there, the fish spits him up. Jonah comes back, uh, and, and, and in my personal belief, comes back to life. And by the way, J. Vernon McGee also believes that exact same thing, that he was actually dead and he was resurrected. So that's part of a sign. Jesus was dead, was resurrected. And then he goes and he preaches to Nineveh. But we're talking about prophetic patterns here. So let's take a look at, at prophetic patterns. And you can research this through the scriptures, and you can research this through history recorded history. And not only that, archaeologists who have dug up uh, cu uh, the, the, the writing of that time, I want to say cuneiform, but whatever writing it was at that particular time, this particular writing proves this same uh, idea. Even to the date, it proves this. So here's the, here's the prophetic pattern, and I want, I'm going to go through this kind of quick. You can look up the dates later. In Nineveh, they had experienced a plague. Plague. Hmm, interesting a plague in 765 B.C. Two years later, in 763 B.C., so this is the 8th century, okay, B.C., before Christ comes, okay, in 763, two years later, from the plague, there was an eclipse. Now, this eclipse, you can look it up, it's the Bursagel eclipse, and it is it, it, it is mathematically put down to the date of April, I'm sorry, June the 15th of 763 BC. There was an eclipse. That eclipse preceded Jonah walking in in 760, which would be three years later, and the people of Nineveh were ripe unto harvest. They, had, they, they were superstitious. They saw this eclipse. They knew that an eclipse meant something was going to come. For example, all of these things that Jesus talked about, the, there was destruction that followed behind them. It, it was, uh, it was a, a consequence that took place. They saw the eclipse. Jonah walks in, and Jonah's... Jo Here's another thing, the connection with Jesus and Jonah. Jonah's only sermon that he spoke can be 
melted down into one word, the same with Jesus Christ. And that word was repent. Nineveh was ripe unto harvest like today we are ripe unto harvest here in the United States. And the word we got to preach is the same word here that Jonah preached, that Jesus preached, which is repent. And he preaches it and Nineveh repents right about 760 uh, BC. Now, following 760, of course, Nineveh doesn't continue in repentance. They don't accept Jesus Christ. Or they don't accept uh, the Messiah. They don't accept the Jewish religion. They don't change. Uh, uh, and so uh, a year later from that point, in about 759, uh, there is a, a second plague that comes upon them. And then four years later, you have a, and this is recorded by seismologists, a magnitude 8 or eight magnitude, this rattles the molars in your teeth. An eight magnitude earthquake took place on 755 BC. This is the exact earthquake that Amos is talking about, that Isaiah uh, references, that Zechariah references. That exact earthquake, which was prophesied and came to pass as well, takes place during Jonah's time. Now, earthquakes. Will they come? Well, let's take a look at some patterns that we have real quick that I'm going to show you a couple of things uh, that have to do with us. And the first slide is going to be uh, a slide that covers, uh, let me see, August 21st, 2017, three years ago. In August 21st, 2017, three years ago, you all will remember this, that there was an earthquake that passed, um, excuse me, an eclipse that passed across the United States. And this was the pattern that it showed. Uh, this is the pattern that it went through. Here where we are, we, where we, are, we saw a partial bit of it and it, it, it darkened the area. And of course, eclipses are always just, just odd and, and, and weird. Okay, that was on again, uh, August 21st, 2017. But here's something else, because now we're going to the signs in the sky. Remember, the pattern of Nineveh. We have plague, we have eclipse, we have repentance, we have plague, we have earthquake. Not that it has to follow that, that particular, particular pattern, but we have eclipses and earthquakes at the, uh, uh, within that 10-year window. Okay, now... We're looking at a seven-year window with us here. So this takes place on August 21st. It is said that Christ lived on this planet 33 years. 33 days after this eclipse, there was a sign in the heavens. Some people mistook it that this is the day of the rapture. Again, we are not assigning dates. What we are doing is we're looking at the figs being ripened. We're looking at the signs so that we know we are in those times. We need to get ourselves ready, make ourselves ready, ready our homes. Okay, 33 days later, this takes place on September the 23rd, 2017. There is an alignment and this alignment is on the third day of Rosh Hashanah, uh, a Jewish holiday, which is a 10-day holiday of the idea of penitence. Christ took the price for us on his 33rd year of life. 33 days after the eclipse, we have this. And this, a lot of people directly relate it to Revelation Chap, uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it reads like this. And there appeared a great wonder in heavens, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Those, and I'm not talking uh, astrologers. We're not looking at astrology. That is of Satan. We're looking at science, astronomy. That look at this over here. And in the, uh, the, the first chapter of Genesis, God tells us that he's given us the stars as a sign to, 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 to show us the, the, the patterns, to show us the seasons. These planets lined up. And if you take a look up here, which I'm sure you already have, 
once in every 7,000 years this takes place. All right, there's another seven. So the planets line up, those stars line up in their configuration, which are within the constellation of, uh, uh, of, of Leo. Again, not astrology, but if you look in Job as well, Job talks about the creation being told and the whole story of man being told within the stars. And then we have uh, Virgo over here and these lining up as well to point out the, 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 this whole sign. Uh, and then here's some other dates that you can take a look into later on. But it talks about a virgin, a woman who's clothed by the sun, the moon. It was at that time. It was under her feet at that particular point in time. And uh, that uh, she, she will be uh, in, in travailing in pain to be delivered. It, it, it's a prophecy. It's a sign. Uh, we go back to Matthew uh, chapter 24 real quick. Verse 30, it says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. I want to talk to you a little bit about that because that sign isn't like some of the other signs. In the, in the uh, 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 idea of prophecy, when they talk about signs, there's the signs where they, they broadcast with a trumpet, kind of like going to war. This is a warning sign. Take heed. This is taking place. Be ready. This sign, the way it's written here, uh, the, uh, Jewish scholars talk about this sign isn't one with the trumpet blast, but it's one to be visible that we will see, but it doesn't mean that it's going to take place immediately. That's why some people, prognosticators I'll call them, were wrong in saying that this is when Jesus was going to return, because again, we don't know the day or the hour, all right? But we know the season, and they're talking that this was a sign. Okay, so that August 21st, we have an eclipse. August, uh, September 23rd, 33 days later, we have an alignment. Now we're in 2020. Uh, think about the plague that we are dealing with at this particular point. Now, uh, next slide. In October of, uh, uh, of 2023... Uh, and it's not on here, so I'm going to explain that in a little bit. There's going to be another eclipse that will pass the United States. We here in New Mexico will be uh, under that path directly. Albuquerque will see this. We here in Aztec will see this, uh, and this will take place on October the 14th, 2023. And I want to point out that because there's going to be one a few days after that, and it's going to be on April the 8th, 2024, and which will be a Monday, and that eclipse is going to pass over, and you see the path of that second eclipse, which will go from the bottom of the United States to the top of the United States in an eastern fashion. The other eclipse that I'm talking about that will happen six months prior, there, uh, it's being nicknamed the Cross of Texas uh, because it's going to come down here through New Mexico and, and it enters pretty much about the same place as that one and it will come across here in New Mexico and it will cross right here in this area. This area that it crosses over happens to be San Antonio, Texas or just that area of San Antonio, Texas. Okay, what do, the, what do those have to do? What do the eclipses have to do with earthquakes? Let me show you real super fast what they have to do with e e uh, earthquakes or potential earthquakes. Right here where this crosses over, above San Antonio, from Del Rio, Texas to Dallas, there's kind of like a curve, there is a fault zone right there, and it is known as the Balcones Fault Line or Balcones Fault Zone, and it goes right through that first X. Right where the X crosses over, it hits dead center on that fault line. Here's another interesting thing. This second one that comes through right here on April 8, 2004, it makes an X with the first one that happened from our timeline right now, three years ago. This next one will happen three and four years ago, a time period of seven years. This crossover right here happens to be directly over the new Madrid fault line. 
If you want to read some interesting stuff about that particular new matter fault line in 1812, and it was also prophesied, and there was also an eclipse just prior to that earthquake. That earthquake was so bad in 1812, uh, the December into the January and February, three particular ones, three in particular, the, the magnitude was up close to eight. It caused the Mississippi River to rush backwards, and it destroyed a lot of those areas. And seven of our United States were touched because of it, were destroyed in that area. Uh, they're, they're, they felt the quakes all the way on the East Coast. And uh, not only that, as our United States came together, the New Madrid Fault today still touches those seven particular states. Am I predicting an earthquake after this? No, I'm not. But I'm looking at patterns in the Bible, and the Bible says that there's eclipses and then there's earthquakes that take place. There's a pattern in Job, uh, I'm sorry, in, in uh, Jonah to point this out. What I'm saying is simply this, that when we look at prophecy, we also have to look at what God set up to show us this prophecy. He uses his prophets and the words. If we don't listen to that, he's not going to leave us without excuse. He's used the heavens. He's used nature to be able to do this. Here's something a little also for the United States. Remember, I told you that it's not written into prophecy, but because we're under this covenant, we have been grafted in. We are held to the same standard. If we fail to repent, there will be consequences. And I want to point this out, that there was a gentleman who, and I'll call him that, who uh, decided as a civil war was coming to an end that he was one of the, one of the, one of the uh, uh, leaders uh, here in the Glorietta Pass at the end of the, end of the civil war, uh, two years before the, 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 the civil war is completely over. Uh, he, he's he's uh, uh, well known as a general there. And then from that point, he goes up into Colorado with the first Colorado uh, cavalry, which is already about to be disbanded, and he does something absolutely horrible. He then, and, and, and for some reason, the name is not coming to mind. Uh, this is history that, 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 I, that I generally often uh, 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 cover in Civil War history, but, but his, his name is not coming to my mind right this second. He staged what is known as the Sand Creek Massacre, where uh, the Cheyenne and the Aurora were just decimated. He, he, he scalped them. He, he did horrible things the night before. He and his men, who were soon to be disbanded, the Civil War was, it was coming to an end. They weren't going to need that cavalry anymore. And he had a bent on hating the Native Americans, so he wanted to uh, keep the, what was known as the Colorado Wars going. And this took place in the southeastern corner of, uh, uh, of Colorado, which is also the north, the area that I'm going to be talking about here is the northeastern part of New Mexico, touches the panhandle of Texas, touches the panhandle of Oklahoma, and touches Nebraska, all the west side, and a little bit of the west side of Colorado. So the Sand Creek Massacre, which was just a few miles north of Lamar, Colorado, in that uh, 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 southeast corner of Colorado, this massacre takes place. The general is basically rebuked by the United States. This general, Shivington, thank you, Lord Jesus, Shivington, retires in Denver after a failed, 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 failed life. The president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, is assassinated. And then, nothing as far as any correction no penalty was ever paid for that massacre. Seventy years later, in that exact area, and blowing across was what was deemed as the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. 
was that consequence for unrepented sin across the United States. Also at that same time, in the 30s, 2930, is when we have the Great Depression. So many people had to leave that area. Innocent blood spilt that was never accounted for. What else do we have to repent of? Well, let me see. Since 1964, we are now way up over 50 million aborted babies in this country. Innocent blood. The idolatry. Look at how many people begin to panic. Oh, what are we going to do about this sport, about that sport, uh, 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 about uh, what are we going to be able to do about this and the other? And even during the more tempestuous times of this uh, outbreak that we're going through, this plague that we're going through, it was recorded that pornography usage skyrocketed and went way up across the United States. Even during this plague, and that's why I'm saying, don't necessarily look, we study these, but don't necessarily look to that to change people's minds. People's minds won't be changed until they decide, look, what I have done before God is a sin, and that's why you and I have to take this message to them. The same message that Jonah had, the same message that Jesus had, which is repent, because the day of the Lord is at hand. There are enough signs. There are enough patterns. And there's so many more. I don't have the time to cover all of them. I just wanted, you, wanted to give you a small glimpse of this, this point that we're in. We're kind of like at that midpoint. Three years before, three years after, then the next eclipse, four years after, then the other eclipse. Who knows? Who knows what will happen? But those eclipses cross right directly over two fault zones in the United States. As goes Israel, so goes the United States. We fall under the same thing if we, who are called by His name, then we have to live to that same standard. And He calls us in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14, that we, who are called, who want to say we are Christian, if we, we first have to repent, but we have to humble ourselves, we have to stop thinking we're more important than we are. We have to humble ourselves. We have to pray. We have to seek His face, not look to any government to bail us out, not look to any entity, not looking to ourselves, but seeking His face. And if we turn from our evil ways, everything, and we have to repent whether you committed abortion here in the United States or not, whether you have committed adultery, whether you have looked at pornography or not, whether you have murdered innocent life or not, we have to take this on because the scripture calls us high priests just as the high priest would every year at atonement come and would take on, take on the sins of all the people and repent of them. We as Christ's high priests here as the church need to take on these sins and wail and mourn and repent of them for our nation, that the land would be healed. And his promise in that same scripture says that he will hear from heaven. He will hear a repentant heart. He will hear the repentant mourns. He will hear the repentant cries. And he will heal, heal us. But before he heals our land, it says that he will forgive us of those sins. And that's more more important than healing our lands is that we have this forgiveness because then and only then are we in right standing with him and in right and readiness for passage into heaven with him. Then it says he will heal our lands. We got to stop thinking lands as in literal lands or as in uh, our pocketbook. We have to start thinking as in our minds. Our minds have to be renewed. How many years of ungodly television are stored up there that the devil can play with? How many years of idle time have we spent that the devil can use against us? We have to be renewed in our minds. Our minds have to 
to be healed. How many people are walking this planet whose hearts have been destroyed, their emotions are completely crushed, and they're completely lost? Those lands have to be healed. Our hearts, our minds, our spirit, our soul needs to be healed, but it will not happen until we fall on our face before God. The signs are there. Don't let us be all uh, enraptured and ear prickled by them and ear tingled by all the signs. The signs are there. They're just a point to us to say, hey, get ready. This is going to take place. But we have to be ready. And in this private conversation that Jesus has with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, that one day will be split in two. Perhaps even in the exact spot where Jesus was talking that very same night, the call to them was to be ready because these things will take place. And the call today is exactly the same. The signs are everywhere if you're willing to look, but the signs mean nothing unless you heed them. If there is a stop sign there, but you decide to disregard the stop sign and barrel through the intersection and end up in a collision course with somebody else, the consequence of that is great. Could even be fatal. But the consequence of not being right with Christ when the rapture occurs, which is very, very soon and can happen even before this recording ends. The consequence for that would be eternal damnation or eternity in heaven with our Lord and our Savior. What will you choose today? The signs are all around us. Don't get bogged down with the signs, but understand the message. And the message is, repent. Be ready. Repent and be ready. I pray that you take this to heart and that we fall on our faces even now before God and begin repenting for the things in our lives. Shivington, who massacred the Indians in Colorado, his father, years before, was part of those that would massacre other Indians just after the long walk. What in our family do we keep perpetuating? What comes up within our family? Repent of that. Allow God to heal that land even right now. And I pray that as you had that very same thought of what's happening with me, these generational influences, and why can't I break them? Here's how you break them. Repent. And I know that some of you are doing that right this very second. Continue to repent for God. Now is not a time of celebration. Now is not a time of jubilee and exaltation. Now is a time of mourning. Now is a time of putting our face to the ground and repenting before God. Let us repent. Let us repent. He will hear us from heaven. He will forgive us. And He will heal our land. He says, heaven and earth will pass, but my words will never pass. I pray that's your prayer this morning. And if it is, please contact us so, so that we can know how we can help you in your continued walk. If you heard this for the first time and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, contact us. Let us know how we can help you in that. How we can walk you through this repentance. I pray in Jesus' name that you would do so. I plead with you, with everything in me, that you would repent and that you would prepare your entire life for his soon return. In Jesus' name. 
May God bless you. May He keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you and give you grace. May He lift up His countenance to you and give you peace. God bless you.